to go. Um, just want to thank uh, Professor Louis Crowley for Crowley, depends on what Crowley, we say Crowley, thanks, Josh. <laughs> That's my <laughs> world roots there, uh, Louise. It's it's always yeah, it's it's the Coughlin Colin thing as well. So um apologies for stepping on your feet in any in any way. But um so we're very privileged and I'm very thankful to Louise because I'm 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 very mindful of how busy you are and how committed you are to, 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 to spreading the message on bystander. And it's a very important message. And I, I was just uh, probably on Twitter way too much this week recovering from Omicron. I, I need to get the phone out of my hand. Um, but I saw you were also uh, north of the border in, in Stormont. And uh, you might just maybe fill us in a little bit on that later on. Um, so basically, um, tonight is just a conversation, hopefully, just to, uh, to give us a little bit more information on Bystander, um, why we should be, what we need to know about it, what it's about, and maybe uh, how we can maybe spread the word to, to Green Party members and others to be part of that and join up and sure. actually train. Um, so that's basically it. So maybe, Louise, if you could just do a, a presentation or whatever you feel yeah. like, say a few words on it, and then we maybe just have a seeing there's only four or five of us, uh, we could just like have a conversation for five sure. minutes. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, John. Thanks for the yeah. invitation. Really delighted to meet you all this evening. And just to give you an insight into the work that we're doing in UCC, which is also impacting beyond the gates of UCC at second level in industry and in sports and, and, and other organizations. Um, so I do have a short presentation, which I think helps with the visual and, and to kind of give you a sense of What's happening? So I'll share my screen. Screen um, uh, and okay, you need to let me share my screen. John, can you make me a host? Uh, Oliver, can you make Louise a host, please? Yeah, that should be done now. Yeah, thanks. Great. Got it. Uh, no, can you see that? Yeah, great. Okay, so I suppose so. Briefly, I mean, some of you may not be familiar with the program, so it is a, a program that is evidence-based and that seeks, in essence, to educate and empower all participants to identify and recognize all forms of unacceptable behavior, uh, you know, I suppose on the basis that, you know, we can't make an intervention unless we are conscious of, see, we see and we recognize um, unacceptable behavior, and it, it's developed in the context of sexual harassment and violence specifically. Um, and then beyond that piece of education, uh, developing that sense of personal responsibility for the well-being of others and the standards within which we live in our community, on our campus, in our in our party organization, in our workplace, um, and to develop the skills to make safe and effective interventions, whatever they might look like. And I'll speak later about the range of ways in which we can we can be proactive in this way. So it is a it is an education-based program, as I say, developed in UCC beginning in about 2016. So um uh, the four central aims very quickly are first of all to introduce what well, it says students, but we've gone well beyond that now all participants to the concept of an active bystander. So I guess activating in people's heads the fact that you are a member of society, you are a member of a peer group and that you have the capacity to intervene and support others who may be vulnerable, who may need support after an incident, or you may simply want to assert your preference in terms of standards, how we speak to each other and how we treat each other. Um, and as a bystander, not directly involved in a particular incident or a conversation, or an incident, but you're a witness to it. And so you can be active in, I guess, steering the outcome or steering the direction of behavior. And beyond realizing individual capacity as a bystander, we then very um, clearly um, and deliberately seek to educate all participants to, um, to a range, on a range of issues. As I said, firstly, to recognize the boundaries of acceptable behavior and in so doing, acknowledging and recognizing the whole range of um, sexual hostility, harassment, everyday sexism and, and violence that occurs in our society all the time. And, you know, we become very acutely aware of it after incidents like the tragic murder of Ashley Murphy and the murder of so many other women, many of whom are under the radar, sadly, um, in, our, in Ireland over the years um, and the serious sexual assault and all of the forms of abuse that happen. And whilst we are outraged and devastated when those things happen individually and as a society, we really need to be outraged by all forms of behaviour. So it is really about getting participants to understand that whole range and that we need to be shocked and outraged by all forms and respond to them accordingly. In other words, that we don't have any level of acceptance. And also other issues that we cover with the participants are acknowledging and recognizing intervention and ambition, why we the instinct might be to walk away, not get involved, let someone else deal with the issue and you know how we kind of challenge that 
in the learning, um, recognizing it can be very difficult. You might need to be very brave. You may be in fear of physical retaliation, social isolation. You know, you may feel you're the only one who's uncomfortable about this. So we work through all of those complex issues um, and get people to better understand that they're not the only one um, that might be uncomfortable with that. Our fear of, of being rejected or mocked or, you know, um, thought poorly of can often, particularly in front of our peer group, stop us or inhibit us from doing what we know is the right thing. So we tease through all of that, both through kind of theoretical learning as well as scenarios and getting people to understand their own instinctive responses. And then we work with social norms to get people to realize that they're not the only one who feels this way. And, and those are all very empowering areas of development to allow people to feel braver and be more emboldened and feel safer to speaking up and, and making an intervention. And then we do cover you know, the law and the, the, the whole issues of consent, sex definition of rape, sexual assault. So people can understand the nature of incidents as they occur. And that's really important because we know from third level research that a significant number of people who've been raped do not report. Why? Because they don't think it's serious enough. People failing to understand the gravity of the behavior that they're experiencing and that it's not okay to be treated in this way. So we do dig deep into that so that there's a, there's a better understanding, whether you're a victim, whether you're a perpetrator or whether you are a bystander or a witness to any of these actions. And then we move on to the empowering piece. So it's all very well to have the capacity to identify, to have the sense of responsibility to act but it's really important that as a part of this learning that we support people in learning to how to act, when to act, what to say, what to do, what not to do, what to do safely. So we go through all of that in the learning. And again, triggering the, under, triggering the understanding that we can react in a range of ways. So when I talk about bystander intervention for the first time to somebody, typically in their head, I know they're thinking confrontation. I know they think, you know, put the fists up, going and tackling the situation and stopping it. Whereas in reality, most interventions can be incredibly subtle and nuanced, for example, interrupting, removing, uh, disturbing a situation, um, not laughing at a joke, and um, pulling someone aside and, 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 and challenging them on their behavior, shifting attitudes, you know, removing somebody from a situation where something hasn't even happened, but you get the sense there might be danger imminent, or you get red flags about behavior and that you can say, come on, let's get out of here, or you tell your friend, you know, they're misbehaving, you might speak to them or you might remove them from the situation. So interrupt and distraction removal can all be hugely effective, very nuanced and not confrontational at all. So we work through all of that. And then finally, I suppose the fourth aim of the, the whole program is about that institutional culture piece. So in UCC, it began as an idea that we wanted to create a safe space for our students and then in turn our staff to uh, explore issues that we all find challenging. It's a very sensitive area. It's a very troublesome area. I know there are survivors in the classroom. I know there are perpetrators in the room and lots of people in between. And we need to be very sensitive of that, but equally we can't shy away from the reality of this the absolute pandemic in society of sexual harassment and violence on, in whatever form. So it's about changing that culture and it's about empowering the people on the ground to be the change. And when I say the people on the ground, I mean all of the institutions. So for example, in UCC, we're not just talking about the students, we're talking about the staff, we're talking about the student leaders, we're talking about the university leaders, the management who've all taken the training. We're talking about the lecturers, the tutors, all of those people who support students, but who also work uh, in UCC and have personal interactions with people on a daily basis. So it's about recognizing that all of community responsibility, but also the capacity when you educate and empower people to be part of the change, to demand better and to be the difference. So that's what it's about. So for, you know, for example, for your own party, it's about recognizing the values that currently exist within your party, recognizing challenges that might exist in terms of personal interaction, whether you, they're visible or not, whether you're aware of them or not, but you can be sure they exist for people. Um, and it's about developing the awareness piece, which is critical. I mean, it's, it's incredible working with young students and they say, you know, they're, they're quite, they can be quite, you know, focused on their own world and what they look like and what people think of them. And they're quite oblivious sometimes to what goes on around them. And maybe we're all a bit guilty of that. But I know that one, one guy said to me once, God, Louise, I can't go out on Saturday night anymore because I just am so aware. I'm seeing everybody. I'm watching everybody. You know, just that his antenna were on. And we all need to put our antenna on a small bit and just be aware that as bystanders, we are actually witnesses to so much and that we have the capacity in a very subtle way sometimes to, to make a difference by speaking up. So just very quickly, 30 seconds, how we delivered at UCC since 2019. It's an online training program, essentially, but with a, a blended element. So all participants, staff or students do about two hours. It's, you do it in your own time. So it's about two hours. It's four modules. It's self-directed. So you do it on your laptop at your ease. You work your way through the four modules. You can see the issues that we cover there. Um, and there's a lot of interactions. We've embedded discussion boards. We use Padlet, which is a tool which allows you to respond to questions that will be posed on what's troublesome about this. Do you think this constitutes sexual harassment? Why? 
how might you intervene here? And you get to respond. Your response goes on what is like a black, like a board, like a notice board. And then you see all the responses by your colleagues, you know, the other lecturers and you see or the students. And that's an incredible moment for people because they see their, their, their responses are mirrored in the responses of so many other people. And you suddenly realize that everybody doesn't, everybody's shocked by this guy in the scenario who's, you know, sexually harassing the guy he's working with or, or a woman is sexually harassing the guy she's working with. And people are saying, you know, this is not acceptable or this is what it comes to, or I would do this or I would do the other. And that shared response is really empowering because people realize, you know, this is not okay. And everybody thinks this is not okay. And it's a way for us to allow people to have that shared response. And then finally, we have an in-person workshop. So once people have completed the online training, we have an opportunity for about an hour. We take about 10 or 12 participants at a time who've completed the training. And we reflect on you know, the impact of the learning, the key things that they took away from it. And then we work through vignettes or scenarios where we give examples of what are fictional scenarios. We've developed them with the staff, we've developed them with the students in conjunction with our campus and community guards. And um, also using you know, research data to, to develop and cultivate scenarios that will ask the questions of people, what do you think is problematic here and what might you do? And it really is one of the best parts of the teaching experience on this training in that you can see people applying the learning, sharing with their peers, teasing out the different ways in which you could respond, what might happen if you do X and why might Y be a better option? And a really good example there is, you know, we use a scenario about, um, you know, you're on a bus going home from college and there's another woman on the bus across from you and, you know, the bus stops and a group of lads get on the bus and they're in their their football gear or some soccer gear, some sporting gear. And they go down the back of the bus and they've got a cup. They've obviously won some tournament and they're delighted and they've had a few beers and they're quite loud. And then they start jeering at the woman on the bus and they call her down to give the captain a kiss because he got the winning goal and she's gorgeous and she's this and she's the other. And she's really uncomfortable. And you think, gosh, what can I do? You know, you're not involved. It's her, it's them. So, you know, we ask people, you know, what would you do? And um. If there's a big, tall, strapping young fella in the class, he'll usually say, oh, I'll go down and I'd start them out. And I say to him, well, would you, would you really all by yourself? And he kind of starts thinking, yeah, maybe I wouldn't. And then somebody will say, oh, I'd go to the bus driver uh, and see if they'd kick him off the bus. And I know that, you know, it's kind of hit and miss with bus drivers. They're great at their job, which is driving the bus. And they may very well say, no, my job is driving the bus. You, know, you can make a report when you get to the station or whatever. So, you know, that can work. I mean, I do know there are buses that stop and kick people off on College Road. I've heard that it happens. So that can be hit or miss. But hopefully somebody will eventually say, gosh, I definitely wouldn't go down to them. But, you know, I might say to the lady, would you like me to sit next to you? Or maybe I just stand in the eye line between the woman and the lads and just cut it off. You know, stop the situation without saying anything or without, you know, overtly doing an awful lot. And there you are, an active bystander, doing what is safe and effective for you within your limits and your capacity. So it's just a brilliant forum where people start going, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I never thought of that. And I don't have to go down with my fist and say, lads, shut up or get off the bus, because like, I don't think there are very many of us who ought to do that if anybody. You know, another thing could be to ring the guards and say, you catch us at the next bus stop, you know, halfway up the model car mode. I don't know, whatever the case may be. But it's about opening your mind. So just as it's so important to recognize the range of behaviors, which I actually have on the next slide, it's really important that we recognize the range of opportunities that we have in terms of timing, in terms of the verbal, the nonverbal, and all the other ways in which we can react. So, um, so just this is just to make the point that we're talking about all forms of unacceptable behavior. We can't have a line where it's, ah, that's okay, that's only minor, you know, that's a bit of crap. There is no level of behavior that, that is acceptable where it impacts negatively on the person who's on the receiving end, typically, but not always women. And, you know, if we allow the online harassment or the lewd images or the, or the cat calling, the whistling out the window, if we allow that, we are simply giving those who do that, that sense of permission that that's okay. And we know that that will encourage some people to escalate their behavior. So just briefly, and I, I mentioned this, the idea that if you're going to make an intervention, so we work through this in the training, you need to, first of all, have the awareness piece. Do you notice something has happened? Secondly, you can recognize it as problematic. And going through the training, you get to develop an understanding and a recognition of the whole range of behaviors. And um, thirdly, you feel a responsibility. You're not involved, but you feel either a responsibility to do something about it. And finally, you have the skills to act. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is that we're here. Most people, and this is really important, most people, most men do have healthy and positive relationships with women and with others, but there is a minority who do not. Obviously, that's why we have a problem. But the problem is, so long as we all stay silent, either we fail to recognize or we fail to act, the people perpetrating have no other thing to feel than that they're hilarious, Nobody is objected to them, so they must be in the majority. This must be how everybody wants to act and everybody thinks. And so, so long as we stay silent, we are allowing them to believe the behavior is acceptable. And so why would they stop if they're not being challenged? There are no consequences for them. So where we need to get to is we need that 
that, that large number of decent people to become vocal decent people, active decent people, calling out unacceptable behavior. And I often somewhat glibly correlate it with, you know, the smoking ban. If you were in a pub now tonight and you saw somebody sitting at the table next to you having a fag, you'd be like, you'd be shocked. Everybody would turn around and go, oh my God, what are you doing? Like you just wouldn't see it. And that's how I want it to be for anybody who whistles on the street or comments on the length of a girl's skirt or grabs somebody in a nightclub or any of those behaviors, right up to obviously much more serious behavior. We want, I want the whole world to turn around and go, what is wrong with you? We need to call it all out. So that group will become very tiny because a lot of the people in the middle of the Venn diagram are going along for the crack. Sure, I'm not going to challenge my buddy, you know, but if it becomes very socially uncomfortable to be that guy or to be hanging out with that guy, those people, nudge theory tells us they'll be over in that blue circle as quick as they can. So that's where we need to get. We need it to be entirely unacceptable for any kind of behavior across the whole spectrum. So that's where we're trying to get to this new normal, this idea that it's entirely, um, you, we have to have zero tolerance. So just on that final uh, workshop five, which is called workshop five because it's the fifth workshop and I had no imagination at the time of creation. So that's what we call it. But you know, it's about giving that safe space again to reflect on the learning, to share the messages and to allow for those reflections on those role plays that we get, we have. And really it comes back to providing that safe environment. I've known that everybody on this call has felt uncomfortable in situations. It's very difficult to know who you can talk to about it and, and how you can develop that conversation. So this gives that opportunity, but I truly believe that the best conversations will happen after people leave the room with their peers, with their colleagues, when the opportunity arises. One quick little side story. In 2019, we put a mural on the Boo Library wall. So those of you who know UCC between the Boo Library and the mini rest, that big long wall that's there. So it would be the most dominant wall on campus right in the middle. And I convinced the academic board to allow me to put up a whole load of posters, you know, in the traditional old gluing up the cinema, cinema notification posters right across the wall. And they had things like, um, oh, uh, I'm going to send you a dick pic. And oh, uh, um, you know, uh, yeah, but she, she, she was smiling at me or give us a smile up. And one poster was, ah, but she went home with me. The implication being she went home with me in the taxi. She was fair game, you know, this idea. So I used to go up every couple of days just to kind of keep an eye and see what people were commenting on it, what people stopping to look at it. And one day I went up and three young fellas were standing, maybe 19, were standing by the mini rest and looking over and having a laugh. And one of them said, oh yeah, she goes home with you. You know, you're in then. And his two friends just turned around and said, don't be ridiculous. You ask for consent on the way home. And then you ask for it again when you go in the door. And I was like, woohoo, my work here is done. So I don't think they probably had done the training. They stood there. We just had this trigger on the wall and they taught themselves what was socially acceptable and their peers were willing to challenge. And that was just for me, the perfect example of, you know, you can bring the horse to water. Well, you know what they drank. And that, that was just brilliant. So we need to create those safe spaces and give people the language of the words and the, the bravery to speak up. So I'm going to finish now, but I just want to share with you the impact of the training. So I have figures for the participants in 2020 to 21 and 21 to 22. So I'm going to share 2020 to 21 with you. These are just three questions of the range of questions we ask people before they start the training and then when they finish the training. So the first of the three questions is, there is little I can do about sexual harassment and violence at my institution. So before people did the training, 54%, um, which isn't bad, said, you know, I can make a difference about sexual harassment and violence at my institution. And 44% said, yeah, I have a limited capacity. So like that's a decent number, okay? But then after the training, 82% said, yes, I can make a difference. No, actually. And then 17, I have a limited capacity. So you'll see the shift very significantly there in terms of personal responsibility for the campus standards and the addressing of sexual harassment and violence. Like 82% of people saying, yes, I can make a difference is really significant. So the next question then, I have a good understanding of what constitutes sexual harassment and violence. And for me, this is, you know, bystander 101 for two reasons. One, you're never gonna make an intervention unless you see something as problematic or troublesome. And if you think, of course I get groped when I go to a nightclub, that's what happens when I go to a nightclub. And of course someone's gonna send me a picture of their penis to my phone that I don't want to see, but I have a mobile phone, so that's what happens. And that's how the students talk. They, they think that this is just part of being a student. So if you can't recognize it as problematic, you're never going to be even aware of the need to stop it. And secondly, if you were the victim of an assault, you may never realize that you were a victim, that this was wrong, it was a criminal offense because of your lack of education and understanding. And we know that's a problem. So before the training, 69% of participants said, yeah, I have a good understanding. And 28% said, I have a limited understanding. After the training, 96% said they had a good understanding with just three saying they had a limited understanding and less than 1% then didn't have an understanding. So that's a real win in terms of the education piece. And then finally, in terms of the empowerment piece, 
I have a good ability to intervene in a threatening situation. So beforehand, 27%, which isn't unreasonable, said they had a good ability. 50% said they had a limited ability and 23 said, I don't have a clue. After the training, the 23% disappeared to zero. 80% said they agreed they now had an ability and 20% had a limited ability. So for me, that is a sizable shift in terms of recognizing troublesome behavior, believing you can do something about it and actually feeling you have an ability to make an intervention. So when you have all those tools developed, you're in a much stronger position to change the culture and the expectation and norms amongst the campus community. And that, by the way, is staff and students. So just finally, what I want to show you is that this is the finally, even though I've already said finally, this is really finally, John, I know you're used to me. And um, I just have three slides that show things people have done. So we follow up with the students. So three months after they've completed the training and the questionnaire, we ask them, have you made any interventions? So this is just some of the stuff we got back. This is actually 21, 22. Yes, I have seen a girl in an alley on her own looking very intoxicated. I was on a work break and notified my workplace so they knew where I was. I approached the girl and asked if she was okay. She explained she was waiting for her parent. I asked if it was okay that I waited with her so she wasn't on her own and she seemed happy to have me there. I asked to ensure she knew I was there to help and to ensure she wasn't in a dangerous situation. Yes, I helped a girl find her friends on a night out when her friends were lost and some guy would not take no for an answer about going back with his mates. I love this. I'm six foot four, so I simply stood in front of her and he scarpered like a startled dog. To my surprise, yes, the program certainly opened my eyes to the late night real world. Recently on St. Patrick's Day in Cork City Centre, I was with my partner around 1 a.m. when we entered a takeaway where we noticed a young woman who looked quite drunk in a daze and was alone. Concerned, we decided to guide her past groups of young men to buy her some food. She sat and ate with us and once finished, we were able to signal a taxi for her. Thankfully, the driver was very understanding and did not hesitate to take the woman home. I think before this program, I would have had a tendency to walk on and let someone else deal with the problem. Yes, a couple of weeks ago, I was cycling my children home from school near Kent train station when there was a couple, late 20s, walking along very intoxicated. The man was very aggressive to the woman. I didn't jump in as I was taking care of my children, so the most appropriate action was to call the guardie when I got home a few minutes later. I described the couple and the situation and they sent a car out. And finally, Although it wasn't a direct intervention, my friends and I walked a stranger home after a night out as she was alone. I felt this was a very responsible preventative measure. I've been more frank with my discomfort at a couple of my friends making sexist jokes. It's gone down well and they've copped on a bit. I recently had an opportunity to intervene in the way a friend of mine was talking about pronouns. I explained that pronouns and their correct use helps to validate and recognize an identity, further noting that you should be respectful of it. I probably would have let it go before, but I decided to let him know how he made me feel Unfortunately, he took this well and was open about it. And finally, I wouldn't say it was much of an intervention, but I was coming home from my shift when I saw a woman sitting in the curb and I felt it was dangerous to leave her. So I asked her whether everything was fine. Her phone was out of charge. I was able to help her by lending her my phone for the call. I was able to both identify her need for help as well as successfully providing her with a solution. So I think that that's really good demonstration of the ways in which people felt safe in making an appropriate intervention no, nothing may have happened in any of these situations, but something may have. And their interventions, although subtle, somewhat indirect, some direct, may have prevented a terrible thing happening that could have been life changing for somebody. So you can see there was an awareness, there was a recognition that there was a vulnerability and there was a capacity to make the intervention. And I love the way some of them explained what they were doing and why they were doing it to ensure that the vulnerable party wasn't made more vulnerable. So I do have a slide telling you about my second level program, which has been launched in 45 schools and for TY students across the country, but I won't dwell on it. But just to say the feedback has been very interesting. The teachers are delighted to have the tools. They did speak about first years needing an education on how to deal with requests for nudes, particularly if they're so vulnerable in first year. And just one thing here I think is worth mentioning um, about the boys. You, oh yes, very eye-opening experience for the boys, especially when the girls were talking about sexual harassment that they see and experience in school. Many debates on what constitutes harassment, most of the boys only considered physical harm harassment. That in itself is really interesting to hear. So that pilot program is running out across TY schools across the country, 45 schools. I've trained 140 teachers in March. Some of them rolled it out in May, but the majority have embedded it in their curriculum for September to Christmas. So really looking forward to getting more data from the students and the staff on that. So finally, and I'll talk to you in a second when I stop sharing about the way in which the program can be taken by anybody um, in Ireland through uh, access through UCC. Um, and then that's our website if you want to look it up. And then finally, um, just to acknowledge that our program is developed from the UK Intervention Initiative, which was developed by Rachel Fenton and colleagues back in 2014. 
that's me done. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Louise. Um, yeah, as, as usual, um, you, 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 you run through so much and cover so much in so little time. It's incredible. You've got to, I wish I could, I could wish I could be that focused. Um, that's, that's brilliant. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, I know, John, you've heard this about a hundred times, so. Uh, it's all, no, it's open the floor. I have to say, I find the testimonials, the stats, really, you know, the stats get the head. Um, but the, I think the testimonials get the heart, don't they? I mean, those testimonials, I, I, every time I read those, I almost imagine myself in that situation, especially yeah. as, a, as a younger, as a student. And I think they're really, really powerful, actually, mm -hmm. those stories or testimonies. Um, so look, I'll just open it up to the floor there. Um, if, if any people have any questions or comments or contributions they'd like to make, um, now is a, a good opportunity to do so. If anybody would like to ask a question. No questions, but uh, just saying thanks for the course. We, I actually did the course in, in UI Galway um, the year, I think a year ago. Active it? consent? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Very yeah, it's quite, yeah, it's, it, I found it quite useful. Thank you. It's great, great to hear. I suppose, uh, Louise, if I can, if, 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 oh, um, Oliver, you have a question? I do. Um, <clears throat> probably now, maybe I'm putting you on a spot. Uh, Father. But um, we, we've had a, a debate um, in Cork City Council over, you know, conduct of, of politics you know, on, the, on the council chamber floor, um, I, I, you know, gendered issues and, 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 you know, I suppose how, how different members of council are treated um, and perceive their treated and how some people, you know, don't perceive that there's any, any different treatment. Um, I, I, I suppose the question is, you know, since we're in a, in a, a political space here, um, you, do you have thoughts on, on how bystander intervention can be applied in political space? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's a really important question, particularly given my audience. Um, so to backtrack for a sec, we developed, I started developing this in 2015, piloted it in 16, and it was then developed for students. That was my 100% focus. When Simon Harris became minister in the summer of 2019, we met him the first week he was in office. And he said very clearly as minister for higher education, he wanted all initiatives to be targeted at both staff and students. So since then staff and UCC have been taking the training, but recognizing the specific and different contexts within which academics and, and professional support staff and UCC work as a distinct from students um, and the need to acknowledge their lived realities and the types of scenarios they're likely to face we have been working on developing a what we call a staff version but alongside that and actually since the murder of Ashley Murphy that really tragic situation did actually lead to a huge surge in interest across the community in the bystander training so I am currently working with a significant number of public sector private sector sporting organizations big corporates who want their staff to take this training for a better workplace culture and environment so I would place the political environment sort of within that. So we actually next week we're launching our, I mean, it's called our staff version. And what it is, is, and you can, I don't mean to say this glibly now, and I know this is recorded, but it's like our grown up version. It's in the workplace type version. So um, not that our students aren't very grown up, but it's different context. So we have moved some of the content in the direction, certainly the stats and the data is relevant more to the workplace to, you know, not just focus on student experience. We've taken a lot of that out put in you know, general stats and data. Also a lot of the scenarios, some of the embedded videos are workplace scenarios, workplace engagement. So what might be regarded either as everyday sexism in terms of how people are treated based on their gender, but also those types of behaviors, whether it's in a meeting room, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's the culture, where there's an ingrained sexism or harassment or any type of type behavior. So we allow those situations to play out in the training for people to respond to them. And then in turn, what I would say to you is that if people were taking the training so for example you know I'm, if i'm working with a sporting organization we would develop for the, the in-person workshop which is a very important element of the training as far as i'm concerned we would develop scenarios with the people in that sporting organization with the people in a private sector or company who are who want to do the training and we would create with them relevant scenarios just like i worked with the second level students and teachers to create scenarios that reflect what it's like to be a 15 year old. There's no point giving them the UCC student scenarios because it's a whole other world, even though it's only three or four years. So what I would say to you is that 
Um, and th that's why the timing of this is good, is that if any of you or your party wanted to take this training on board, that you would take the staff version. That's so that's straight away more directed to your to your world. And then in turn, I would work with John or whoever was involved in the train the trainer piece or facilitating workshops and above, depending on what we agreed, which would then have conversations around the types of experiences that people are having in the workplace where interventions need to be made, where policies maybe need to be developed, where issues need to be acknowledged and to give people the space to have those preliminary conversations in the workshop, which hopefully then can be supported to continue within the party, within city council or whatever the case may be. So, you know, it, it goes beyond the two hours online and the one hour workshop if you want to cultivate this and make a change. And that's what I mean about the conversations with the three lads on the steps or bringing it into a school where we embed it in a school. So everybody in say, the school of you know, psychology takes the training and then you have capacity for conversations to develop quite naturally because everybody has done the training and people want to buy in and they see their capacity to be part of the training. So I hope that answers your question, Oliver. Yeah, and I think it goes to the participation of women in politics as well, maybe Oliver, uh, that, you know, about, and, and not just, and to be fair, not just women, I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, sometimes we see stuff going on in the doll and you think, you know, as a youth worker, I think, if I was the chair, I'd be shutting this conversation yeah. down right now, because yeah. you're not discussing issues, you're actually just verbally abusing each other, and that seems to be normalised, and... I'm not, I'm not taking a party political stance on it here. No, no absolutely. Because all parties, including our own, have, have probably sinned there. Um, but I just think sometimes I'm looking at it kind of going, you know, if in another context, this conversation would just, their mics would just turn off and they would just be ruled out of order as, as being, you're not addressing the issue. So I think there's culture change, I think, is part of it. Um, um, I'm just wondering, are there any other... I could into into uh, just just interjecting that one because interestingly, I, I, look as 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 an elected rep, I I, I get phone calls on on many different issues, uh, but about a week or so ago, I got a phone call on exactly that issue, um, you know from you know uh, I'm a mature um, constituent, uh, just very disappointed with conduct in in the Doyle. Uh, and you know, just as you said, uh, you know, John, if it was in any other any other context, workplace, in con you know, environment, a, a social environment, it, it you know, it, it wouldn't be tolerated or it shouldn't be tolerated. Um, so yeah. yeah, yeah. I suppose hence the normalization of it. That if somebody doesn't call it out, it is you know, I mean, that, that, exactly, that, that exactly. And it's yeah. about recognizing it for what it is. But you just not you thinking about it, watching the telly, John, and then Oliver, you thinking about it when you get the call. But where is that space where we can talk about it and speak up and support each other and actually challenge it? And it's challenging it is what needs to be done. And, you know. Let's see, Oshin oh, oh, wants to come in there. And um, yeah, Professor Crowley, just, I suppose, taking it forward and in the current world of Zoom and WhatsApp, is there, is there anything, is there something in the training that helps people, you know, deal with things that come up in zoom and whatsapp yeah. because the, you know absolutely Ashina. i mean and we deal with this even in the second level program you know the types of materials and the, what's shared on i mean whatsapp is the perfect example of of providing a platform for people to behave in a really egregious manner and for it very often to go unchecked so i talk about this a lot in various presentations about you know i'm going to say 18 lads in a whatsapp group and somebody shares an image that is pretty outrageous and, you know, the problem is, is that the other 60, well, let's say 15 or 16 of the 18 are looking at it going, oh, Jesus, you know, don't, I wish he didn't send that. Well, I'm not going to say something like who's going to say something. I'd be mortified. Everybody would think I'm like such a geek or I, what's wrong with me? Why can't I have a laugh? But the reality of it is, is that I can tell you 14 or 15 of that group are sitting there thinking the very same thing. So, I mean, I know we need to acknowledge how hard it is for the one person to say, here is cop on would you take that out of the group or i'm going to have to leave the group i mean that's what we should be brave enough to say and if we have enough of these conversations and someone says it well then everybody else should row in and go yeah johnny stop what are you doing we if this if someone takes a screen grab we're all going to get fired or whatever the case may be or you could simply say this is outrageous you can't do this you can't speak about something like that but you know in reality are you going to be brave enough so what i say then about you know we do this through the skills is you know sometimes it's too uncomfortable so what do you do this goes out tonight and you're thinking, oh God, that's awful. And tomorrow, John's in the group too. You meet John and say, John, I don't know how you feel about what, what Frank sent there in the WhatsApp, but I'm really uncomfortable and I don't know what to do about it. And you say, yeah, well, actually I didn't like it either. And so 
I, if I was you then Oshin, I'd say, look, John, if I send in a, you know, would you delete that or, or I'm going to have to leave the WhatsApp group, you rock in behind me and say, yeah, Frank, you know, that's not acceptable. And that's about creating allies and making a plan, which sometimes has to be done to allow you to be braver. And sometimes when you've done it once, you can do it again. Or also that fellow, did I call him Frank? I may have given him three names, but that fellow who put the image in, it's his turn to feel uncomfortable. And what we need to get to is a place where they need to be the outlier. They need to be the person who's uncomfortable because enough of us are vocal. And I might need rallying the troops the first few times, but then it'll become a more acceptable thing to do, or at least some people are doing it. And then you feel you feel like less of a cry. Now, the reality of it is you're probably speaking on behalf of most of the group. We know this from our research, you know, the social norm research that we do. How would you feel about something if we say to the students, thankfully about 95% of them say, oh yeah, that's terrible. I would want to say something. But then they say, and what do you think about your peers? And generally about 65 or 70% they think would feel bad. So they think that they feel more shocked than a lot of their friends. And then you give them back the stats and say, actually, all of you said you'd been shocked. And then they look around and they go, wow, you all feel the same way as me. I never knew because nobody spoke up. And silence is what, silence is the killer because silence enables those people who are in the minority, but in their heads and in the heads of all the people around that table, they're in the majority because nobody's speaking up. So it's hard, it's difficult, but I do think that ally piece might be the stepping stone we need to get people to be braver. I mean, it is about, I don't know if you listened to Jackson Katz on the radio this morning, but I was at a conference, he was up in Stormont as well, and he spoke about people being leaders. So even though people might fear that they're speaking out, that they'll be objectified as the, you know, the, the, the odd one out, actually they're being the leader and leading the way for others to follow. But the good news is people do want to follow. They just often are slow to be the first one. Yes, that, that was a good interview with, with um, it was on yeah. Brian Turbury, if I remember That's correctly, right. yeah. this morning. And I think that that's very much like the um, the white ribbon campaign in in the domestic violence area. That's like yeah. men, men, uh, you know. And and I think the, the thing about um, the, the bystander interview, it's gender neutral, but but nonetheless, we know we know the reality as well. It's gender neutral, but we don't apologize for the stats, which is most perpetrators yeah. are men. But I suppose yeah. the reality is, women's silence can also. I mean, women who are bystanders. That's very important women who are bystanders, their silence or complicit, com complicit behavior also gives implicit consent. So, you know, just recognizing that there can be times when women speak up, but this is, a, as Jackson Katz would say, this is a ma this is men's problem. You know, it, it too, too, like I've spent 20 years working on this broadly in terms of researching and teaching on intimate partner abuse. And, you know, too often I'm in a conference and it's all women, or I'm sitting around my master's student table with my master's students and it's all women, you know, and really, Women drive this, but with respect, men need to speak up because men will listen to other men to, and stop their behavior for other men. We know men aren't stopping their behavior for other women, sadly, in many instances. So really, even though it's an all a society issue, really, I, I want to put it on men and say we know most men are good, but all men can make a difference. All men can speak up and change what's happening. They can change the culture amongst their peers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I know the area I work in, I mean, probably most people aren't aware that I work in the area of domestic violence. We work with male perpetrators. And these are the kind of things that the men at that sort of I suppose, extreme end of the spectrum do say to us. They say, well, I've never been violent to my wife or my partner. But, you know, like so there's even a hierarchy almost of kind of it, it's if we don't hold people to account, mm. they never become aware yeah, in a sense, that's much fully aware, maybe. Yeah, um, I don't want to be given any excuses or hostages to like, but I think that I do believe these men are aware. But it's society, the more society and 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 all of us make make people accountable for the behavior, the more, the more they have a in a way, in the more they have an opportunity to grow beyond that as well. It, yeah. I don't know if that's overly sympathetic, but um, um, Suzanne, you have a raised hand there, so do you want to come in? Yes, if if that's okay. Sorry, my internet connection keeps getting very crackly and bad, but um, so forgive me if I drop out. I have questions and concerns, I suppose, around how much individuals and the kind of the cultural question can be handled and, and, and where the line is when we, the person has to go to the guards, for example. So there was an article in the paper about a problem in Sinn Féin um, with harassment, which ended up in the court. 
And I know we've, you know, that had gone to their internal political kind of disciplinary procedures and the accusations of bullying and everything. Um, sorry, and not and everything. Um, so I and some of the things that we're talking about here are very clearly a cultural thing that individuals in a group, in a WhatsApp group, can contribute to and change. So I suppose my question is, um, is there a way, not necessarily an easy way, but a way of knowing where that line is that, that a political party, for example, or a workplace knows that this isn't an internal matter and it needs to go to legal situation, an outside legal? Yeah, so I suppose my response to that would be, I suppose it's a quite a broad question in that there is a line where things go beyond the capacity for an individual to be able to speak up and change what is clearly a wrong. And if someone is behaving in a way that is contrary to party policy, workplace policy, contrary to the law, well, that can be above somebody's capacity. But what's not above someone's capacity is either speaking directly to the person who's behaving in this way, supporting the person who's being abused or bullied is another very effective intervention. I see you, I hear you, this is not your fault, I'm sorry this is happening to you. And also bringing it to the attention to the authorities. So just as I would say to students, if there's a fight outside the nightclub, you know, it might not be sensible for you to jump in, but you could call the bouncer and bring them over. So elevate that to your example, your general example, Suzanne, you know, there's an issue going on, someone has been treated very badly. Go to whoever in your party or your workplace is the designated person pursuant to the policy and for them to take the necessary steps pursuant to the, the process that's in place. You know, so I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not, I'm not making it so simplistic that I say, oh, you see something terrible is going down in your party or your workplace, step in there, have a word and you fix it. You know, that probably has gone beyond that. But there may be situations much lower on the, the spectrum of behaviors where you can make an intervention. And even where it is heightened, like I said, just hearing to or having a word with a person who's been treated badly or bullied or whatever, that can be really powerful. So we know our limits. I suppose everybody is different. We all have different skills, different capacities, both physically, mentally, and every other which way. So I always say to, the, to all participants, I mean, the golden rule of bystander intervention is you only make an intervention if it's safe to do so. So you neither exacerbate a situation nor get yourself into a situation where you're now in danger physically or otherwise. And so you need to make a judgment call then on, on what's the best thing to do. So in no way is this a call to arms. In no way this is a call for vigilantes to go fix the world. It's about being aware and it's about making interventions that you're capable of that are safe and that will be effective. And then I don't know because every situation is different, that comes down to your instinct and your judgment. And hopefully by taking the training, your judgment becomes informed in terms of the breadth of ways in which you can act and also the realization of when you shouldn't make an intervention. And sometimes, and I'll finish on this, the most effective intervention may be finding the right person to make the intervention. Yeah, uh, yes. I th and I think maybe where there might be a little bit more of a gray area is at the organizational level, because that seems that's quite official, but it's still not, you know, the law of the land. So I suppose everyone needs to do the training so that the people in an organization who are are the designated person that they know the limits as well and yeah and, and that any sense? yes absolutely and any organization that comes to me and, and i did this in particular with the second level schools for example you know when the schools came to us mm -hmm. i said well if you bring this material into your classroom you have to have a clear accessible policy school policy on any disclosure issues bullying issues sexual harassment issues you need to have identifiable and reachable champions within your staff to who students can go it doesn't necessarily have to be the principal or the SPAG teacher but they have to be recognizable and accessible for the students there has to be supports in place or at least pathways to support so you know this is part of a response this is the prevention education piece but there also needs to be other supports and mechanisms for reporting and support in place to ensure that once you start this conversation because you will trigger people who are either victims, survivors, or currently in a toxic relationship, or maybe perpetrating, or maybe supporting somebody who is in difficulty. You need to make sure that as a party, as a, as a workplace, as a school, as an organization, that you have all of those processes in place. And maybe by introducing these training, it puts, you know, in a good way, positive pressure on the powers that be to ensure that those structures are in place, that there is a clear policy where, you know, though the champions are identifiable and the investigative or exploratory process 
is also accessible and that if someone wants to make a disclosure or seek support, that they know what would be the consequences of opening their mouth, that they don't just stand at the edge of a cliff, make the disclosure and, you know, have no idea what's going to happen for them or the person who they may be accusing of doing something. So all of those elements are really important. I don't think training should be introduced in a vacuum. a really good point that it needs to be embedded as well in the culture but also in the yeah. the other anti-bullying policies child protection mm -hmm. policies i know in, in the in the youth sector you know um like we we have to be con i mean and, and i'm sure in, in similarly in other sectors have to be constantly vigilant and there has to be a reporting hierarchy if you like that mm -hmm. if you know i can deal with something in a room if if someone is telling a homophobic joke it's my job to uh, intervene and, and shut that down and explain why but if it's much more serious than that then there's a reporting there's a reporting procedure and there's a whole hopefully set of policies in in that organization or political party um that can and also can, sorry john if i may on that it would be really important if this training was introduced that it's not just the boots on the ground doing the training management have to buy in you need leadership from the top and you need you know top down bottom up everybody needs to buy into this need for change um, listen, I, I said we'd finish before eight, and I'm I'm um, a man of my word usually. usually. So unless there's any other questions or comments, um, yeah, Bushy. It just I suppose if you're in an organisation and there isn't clarity uh, about these policies and procedures, and you're not exactly. Um, a big cogwheel in that organization. How, how do you bring it to the organization? How do you, you know, how do you, how do you encourage that organization to make it clear, I suppose, that everybody knows that they're, what they're designated, they're, who their designated people are and, and who people should be contacting with their, with their, um, with their issues, I suppose. Alistair, have you the answers? Is that what you're I'll, I'll raise a word for the unions here. Um, yeah. There's one way of doing it. You know, it, it's, it's useful to have an organisation like unions that can actually speak up on your behalf anonymously in many ways. And that's kind okay. Of, if, if it's a political party, then the, the unions won't be able to speak up on, on their part. It, like, it, it is... Yes. down to members and 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 you know but but how do you are or, or in any any other voluntary organization how do you you know uh, voluntary organizations are worried about a lot of stuff mm -hmm. how do you put it up the agenda to to make it make it clear to those organizations that we need to be doing this i i i have to just re reiterate the answer uh you know Unions still have that purpose, even in things like NGOs and so on like that, mm. where everybody voluntarily joins an NGO as a, as a volunteer. But there's still behavior that they, you know, that they may be uncomfortable in exactly that kind of situation. Uh, and it's, use, it's useful that way. Um, you know, it, it, I don't think it's a sign of disloyalty to anybody who might be a member of, uh, you know, a, a, paid, a paid member of staff of the Green Party joins a union. For example. Can, can I just make a, a suggestion there that, um, if, first of all, I mean, most organizations should have a sort of policies that cover this, HR policies, anti-bullying policies, things like that, um, basic respect in the workplace. Um, qu quite often the issue, I think, in small organizations is the person you have a difficulty with might, in fact, be the person you have to report it to. Yeah. So then it's about, um, I suppose it's about getting the knowledge that and maybe this is outside of the bystander. Um, maybe this is we're kind of maybe moving away from bystander now. But um, to be or just to be aware of where you can actually go with those grievances, unions yeah, absolutely could be one, and it, and often is. Um, but it also can be just maybe consulting with legal, get a being a legal consultation, free legal aid, citizens information, things like that as well, just to let you know. Can I actually, uh, Louise? Did you did you want to say something there? Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's complex and obviously every organization has its own issues and challenges. But I think that in 2022, 
if there isn't a decent anti-bullying policy um, and reporting mechanism, it, it's a very poor reflection on any organization. Oh, I have no idea, so I'm not condemning anybody. And I would think that there should be channels that 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 should there should be some channel, you know, whereby internal uh, representations can be made and they have to be sought out. Um, and whether it, you know, and, and after that, I'm afraid it's a matter for those. And I mean, I think that it goes back to the allyship piece, maybe that if you can have a collective of people who come together and say we want change, one being the lone objector or the lone person calling for change is challenging. The lone objector being a bystander is challenging the value of everybody in the party or in UCC or wherever taking the training is that it becomes a shared collective desire. So I suppose coming from that point of view, my advice for what it's worth, um, and this may be beyond my expertise, would be that idea of allyship and coming together and showing that this is an issue for many members and that might get the wheels turning. But I, I suppose from a political perspective, that's one thing that we need to be pay, paying attention to. We are building a, an organization and, you know, if we're not care, if one of the things we need to avoid uh, in building those such organizations is there being a single hierarchical structure in which nobody can bypass or have any say against uh, a boss or somebody in power. You know, well, that can be your homework now for today. Go, <laughs> pick, go fix that. And John, if I could just reiterate before we finish up that this training is available indiv to individuals to sign up. I was in, as you said, Stormont on Monday. Um, and Tuesday working on contributing to inform the new Northern Ireland strategy on ending gender violence against girls, women and girls, sorry, I'm tired, against women and girls. And um, 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 a, a guy in Northern Ireland who works with secondary schools came up to me and said, oh, I did your training. He went on to UCC, paid 10 euro through PayPal, and he had done the bystander training. I'd never met the man before in my life. So, I mean, it is open to the whole world basically to do it if they want to pay 10 euro, which is cheap the price. And um, but equally, if you wanted to come together collectively, that's also something we can talk about. But that staff version will launch probably in about a week, just so you know. So then when you go on, you can select between bystander bracket students, bystander bracket staff, just to say that out loud. Brilliant. And look, that's that's something for us to have the internal conversation yeah. on. And I'm I'm happy to sort of be the to to mediate or facilitate yeah. that in some way. And I'm gonna to stick to my commitment to you, Louise. Um, okay. okay, so just again. Thank you so much. You're always very generous with your time. It is um, very much appreciated. And no thank you. All right. And enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. I will. Okay. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks. Right. Have a good evening. Okay.